Good afternoon. My name is Sam Champong. I'm the regional head for SIPSMENA, which is the Middle East and North Africa office of the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply. Welcome to today's webinar, which is the latest in the SIPS Qatar series of webinars supported by Qatar Development Bank QDB. Now, I'd like to thank QDB for supporting this series of webinars, um, which is specifically aimed at SMEs and SME procurement. So thank you to Q QDB uh, for supporting the series, which includes this uh, past and uh, a load of future webinars. The subject of today's session is SME procurement strategies for the future. And we're very grateful to have Harry Seeley with us today to present the session. If you do have any questions at all as we go through the session, please type them in the Q&A box below. We will allocate plenty of time to answer all of your questions at the end. So now, without further ado, I'll hand over to Harry. Harry, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Sam. Bear with me one moment while I uh, share my screen. Is that sharing okay? Yep. Okay, and a quick flick to the title slide. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much indeed to both QDB and to the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply for inviting me to uh, present this, this session this afternoon. Um, it is a great honor to do so, and I hope that it will be of some interest and benefit to, to everybody. Um, in terms of uh, full disclosure, I am not a professional uh, procurement uh, expert, um, nor am I an expert in finances or economy. My background is environmental management and sustainability, and I am the global technical lead for Jacobs here in the Middle East for sustainability and climate change, representing up to the, uh, the, the corporate team on prospectus from the Middle East, myself and one other colleague in the region do so. Um, the, the other hat I wear and part of the day job is I am Jacobs Environment and Sustainability Manager here in Qatar, where I have been living since 2012 working on a mixture of major programs from um, major tunneling, sewage drainage programs and expressway programs among others. What I'm hoping to do today is basically um, at a, a, from, a, from an overarching perspective, provide uh, those sustainable procurement or procurement professionals on this call with an overarching view on some of the, the, the context that you might need to consider when you're uh, preparing your sustainability strategies or your procurement strategies for your businesses going forwards. So to do that is really important to understand you know, why, why is there such a focus on sustainability? Um, I know it's in the media quite a lot, but uh, it, there, there's a very good chance that uh, a lot of us just get desensitized to that, no matter how harrowing, harrowing or, or dramatic the photographs and images are that we see of um, extreme weather of uh, wildfires like is raging in California at the moment or uh, massive overfishing in the seas, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll touch on the global context, then we'll move on to an example of a climate action plan from my own company, Jacobs. We'll touch on circular economy and some basic principles there before going into uh, the outline of how, how to get ahead with your sustainable procurement strategies and that would be based in and around the execution of the ISO uh, 20,400 strategy. Uh, we'll close off with some uh, quick references to some online resources. So in terms of the global context, um, you will find, and I'm happy to share this, this slide deck afterwards, but you will find that uh, I've included some web references on these. One of the really important reports that comes out every year from the World Economic Reform Forum is the Global Risks uh, report, which looks at both the impacts and likelihood of key risks, having interviewed several thousand uh, businesses globally. And what we've seen over the years is that the green basically here is, is environment or environmental uh, aspects. And what we've seen, for example, in terms of global risks by likelihood, um, carbon, uh, climate action failure, extreme weather, um, natural disasters have dominated the scene since uh, 2013. 
Um, and it's a little bit worrying that uh, it, it tends to, in terms of likelihood, that you get the top five um, for, for certainly the last uh, last few years have been dominated by um, a, a variation of extreme weather, climate action, natural disasters, biodiversity loss, and human-made environmental disasters. So the message there is fairly clear. And this is from a global interview across many different stakeholders. It's not surprising that infectious diseases with the, the horrible pandemic that the, the entire world has been suffering from for coming up 18 months now has ranked as the, the number one impact. But it's also quite concerning that right behind that, in terms of immediate impact, you've got climate action failure, weapons of mass destruction, biodiversity loss, and natural resource chaos, or a natural resource uh, crisis. So th this, this slide is basically to highlight the fact that the environmental issues and sustainability issues are very much uh, a number one priority. Typically, when we talk about sustainability and, and we look at uh, our, our footprint on the environment, and that often falls into three categories, biodiversity, such as the destruction of the Amazon rainforests and uh, destruction of the, uh, the marine life and the oceans that we can't necessarily see, but uh, is, being, is being carried out every day by things like bottom trawling and, and huge overfishing in our oceans. Um, droughts and our water footprint, whether that's uh, over extraction from groundwater resources um, or areas suffering uh, by um, from failure in agriculture and other reasons for uh, on, on, on the basis of uh, increased temperatures and, uh, and lack of available water. But what we will focus today on for the next uh, few minutes is looking at the carbon footprint and greenhouse gases. And what and why is this important? Well. It affects us all, and it is a driving force in the, um, the climate's current trajectory towards uh, increased global warming. As we know, the, the Paris Agreement is trying to keep that under 1.5 degrees of warming by the year 2000 or, or 2100. Um, at the moment, we are definitely not on that trajectory. Uh, we're on a worse trajectory, and that is why it is really important that we can do all we can to, uh, to address that. Uh, the energy footprint is a major part of that. In, in the energy uh, consumption is a major part of uh, CO2 and global warming um, that are, and greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see as part of that, um, energy use in buildings accounts for 17% of it, transport is 16% of it, and energy use in the industry is 24%. You might be surprised to know that uh, despite the level of inactivity and business closures in the course of the pandemic, the actual footprint um, for carbon emissions on the planet didn't reduce anything more than about 7% for that whole period of time. Um, to meet the challenges that we've got at the moment, we need to have at least, if not more, that level of reduction every year, year on year, for the next 10 years, to have even the, sl the slightest chance of getting close to getting the planet back on the trajectory that we need. So you can understand the significance of, uh, of, of the challenge ahead. It's also important to recognize that the uh, efficiencies in energy use in transportation and energy use in, in industry, generally speaking, quite often all roads will lead back to the, um, the, the commercial strategy, the buying strategy, the procurement strategy in the various different organizations. So this is the message, if there's a take home message I want you to get today, it is the fact that the procurement teams um, across the sectors are absolutely crucial to businesses being able to achieve their climate action plans and reduce their carbon footprints and get uh, their, their sustainability performance on track. Without uh, procurement and without uh, sustainable procurement professionals within those procurement teams, it's, it's, uh, it's just not gonna happen. So again, this is just uh, to, to show that it's not just carbon dioxide in terms of the impact on global warming. Carbon dioxide obviously makes up a, a key part of it, but what this shows is you've got other elements in greenhouse gases. One of the worst offenders is, is here, sulfur hexafluoride, which is actually several thousand times, uh, 25,000 times, in fact, worse in terms of its ability to trap heat in the environment than uh, one unit of, of CO2. So it's not just CO2 we're looking at. If, for example, you're procuring substations, you need to make sure that the design of those substations is uh, incorporating uh, dry vacuums and doesn't use uh, the typical agents that have been used historically, which is um, uh, S, uh, or, um, sulfur hexafluoride. 
So it's an example of why, again, procurement needs to be at the core of, of everything that we do. This is basically showing the trajectories that we're on at the moment under the, this is the 2010 scenario. This is the uh, current policy scenario, which is a bit of an improvement, but you can see that um, we are far from being able to get down to what we need here, which is the 1.5 scenario, um, making sure that uh, temperatures don't increase any more than 1.5 by 2050. So there is an urgent need to make drastic action. And this is why you will hear this um, concept of the decade of change, the decade of action. That's why everybody across all sectors needs to make fundamental differences on how we do business. The way we're doing business at the moment is just going to push us up on this, this trajectory. So there needs to be a fundamental rethink and reset of how businesses do uh, or operate um, to be able to make this sharp right-hand turn to turn the trajectory back down to where we need to be. This is just a graphic to show the countries internationally that have actually incorporated um, uh, commitments to, to CO2 reductions by 2050. Um, the, here we've got Germany, UK, France, most of them are in, in Europe. You've got New Zealand in there as well, Denmark, Norway. Um, others where that is being uh, discussed are up around here and where the, this draft legislation is here. I can, I can say as an Irishman that Ireland, the, the Irish Parliament has actually actioned this now. So this is now green, um, but other countries are considering it and others are, are further behind. One of the things that you need to be very careful of as procurement professionals is when your companies start talking about uh, setting out their, um, setting out publicly their goals for re uh, carbon reduction by 2050. Um, invariably, there's a lot of greenwash out there. Um, there's companies make loose um, uh, assumptions or, or, or statements that they're going to be carbon neutral by year X um, without actually having uh, a, a lot of robust planning and strategizing and detail behind it. It's very easy to say something in, in the media to have a soundbite, um, but what's, what's being discovered is that it doesn't actually always hold true that th these organizations have uh, actually got the substance behind what they're saying. So you can see here 200% increase over the last year and a half or so in the number of businesses that have, been, um, that have set net zero goals. 82% um, of senior decision makers say they require more guidance to achieve their net zero target. Well, these two things don't necessarily add up. So if, if the businesses need more guidance to be able to set those targets, but they're actually publicly de declaring them, then there's probably something wrong. Um, and as you can see here, just 0.2% uh, of Fortune 100 board directors have specific climate expertise. Well, I suppose that is not necessarily surprising because board directors are not necessarily going to be climate change experts. But the bottom line is be very careful before you make statements. Also, um, in, in terms of, sorry, I'm just trying to get, uh, there's a banner in my way here. Um, the International uh, Energy Agency this year also, or in fact last year, reduced uh, or, or produced a, an important report, which was basically saying that if organizations, or if the world, if global organi if organizations globally, sorry, if global organi organizations globally don't get a handle on energy efficiency, then we are uh, very unlikely to meet these 2050 targets. So again, what does it come down to? It comes down to the procurement teams in your organizations being aware of how do they calculate carbon footprint before they put these strategies together? How can they improve traveling smart? Are you the guys that are responsible for uh, buying the next fleet of, of, of cars for your organization? Are they going to be uh, fuel cell or are they going to be uh, EVs or are they going to be hybrids? Uh, what are the consequences of each one of those um, concepts? Or indeed, are you going to significantly reduce the fleet and uh, instead incentivize staff to be traveling on local railway networks. Similarly, in terms of solar power, hydrogen capture and cleaner, greener buildings, these are all key. These are all the top five um, pathways that the International Energy Agency has identified as being key to businesses being able to move towards uh, their sustainability objectives. And the ISO goals here, um, and there's hyperlinks as you can see through to each one of these, provides guidance on these. Now, there is some way to go yet in terms of being able to provide uh, specific guidance that is, uh, if you like, bulletproof on net zero um, target setting. Uh, that said, there are organizations like the Science-Based Targets Initiative, 
which uh, do help organizations to do that. So in terms of a climate action plan, um, this, this is an example of um, how Jacobs have approached it. Um, and one of the key things that we needed to do was to make sure that whatever we set out publicly, we were going to be able to achieve um, and, and not fall into that trap of, of, um, of making claims and then finding it difficult to, uh, to support them. So um, universally now, uh, since 2015, the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, all 17 of them, which were basically a product of the, the Paris Agreement in 2015, these are the basis of sustainability frameworks and action plans and management plans and strategies across organizations internationally. If you're not aware of them yet, there's a load of information online to be able to explain exactly what these are um, and very, very readily available. The key one in terms of uh, climate action is goal 13. And this is the, uh, the basis of what our climate action plan was. I won't go into the, the micro detail on this action plan because it's all available online and you're more than welcome to be able to, um, uh, to, to, to browse through it. If you go to jacobs.com, um, you'll find a, a link to the climate action plan at the, at the bottom of the page. But basically, we released it last year on Earth Day, and we set out rather challenging um, objectives to, to, be, uh, to be achieved within the year. So the first question is, what is our carbon footprint? And we understood that to be office energy made only 4% of it, vehicle emissions was 4%. Purchased electricity to run our buildings was 32%, but business travel made up a huge 60% of the, the organization's footprint. Um, so this is, this is the first thing you need to do. You need to understand what it is that your business does that causes, uh, that generates carbon emissions. If you're in manufacturing, you might have um, a different profile. And invariably, you will have a different profile because Jacobs as an organization is a consultancy and therefore our assets are basically uh, staff and, and offices. So in terms of terminology, what you need to be very aware of is the, uh, the concept of scope one and two and three emissions. So scope one is basically um, emissions that you're, you're directly, uh, directly responsible for. So these are your own, um, your own operations. So for example, in scope one, in our, in our case, it was the operation of our company facilities and our company vehicles. The scope two then is the indirect emissions from, from uh, what your activities are. So you buy electricity, therefore there are emissions associated with that electricity. So it's not your office itself that's producing those emissions, but it is the power plant from which you bought the electricity. And then scope three, this is where it all gets very complicated. So scope three is basically uh, the emissions held within our supply chain and how far down that supply chain do you go to get 100% uh, uh, understanding of what your total carbon emissions are. That's an extremely difficult thing to do. And that's why you need to be very careful how you uh, set out your, uh, your, your statements when you're, you say you're going to go carbon neutral. Um, so what we set out was 100% renewable energy for our operations in 2020. We were going to be net carbon for our operations and business travel by 2020. And you can see as, uh, sorry, net zero carbon for our operations and business travel in 2020. And you can see we're very, very specifically state what it is we're doing operations and business travel. And similarly for carbon negative, our operations and business travel by 2030. And this is not something that we can achieve overnight. So how do we do it? Well, invariably you need to offset and buy uh, renewable energy certificates. Um, that is not uh, a cheap get out. That is basically and uh, the a mechanism, uh, a legitimate and well-recognized internationally mechanism to be able to take action um, so that you can offset your, um, your emissions. Longer term, beyond 2022, we're looking at reducing our carbon emissions at source over a longer term, um, a longer term period. And we're looking at doing that with partnerships with renewable power projects, carbon insetting, um, and reduced reliance on, uh, on the RECs and, and, and other such markets. So this is basically liaising with stakeholders where they are actually investing and developing uh, renewable power projects so that we can invest in those projects and therefore drive the development of those projects. In terms of net carbon zero, by 2020, similarly, um, we, we looked to see that 40% of our emissions in 2019 was... Um, was, was associated with, with our operations. So our real estate team 
and obviously our procurement team working closely with our real estate team we're looking on how we can make our buildings more efficient um, similarly in terms of business travel what can we do uh, within the last year it's 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 uh, it's obvious of course that the um, the lockdown uh, forced us all to to work from home very within a very short period so the the real test i, I guess will be this year and the next couple of years to see how those uh, how, how we fare um, and then 2030 looking ahead uh, which is where we are looking to, to uh, get a better handle on our, our wider emissions. We're looking at uh, in innovator accelerator programs, sales and project delivery teams to, to, to look at embedding climate action goals in our sustainability business management systems and, um, and basically making sure that sustainability and uh, climate resilience and climate action are really at the core of everything we do. But this is probably a slide that you're particularly interested in. As you can see at the start here, this is our reliance on on uh, the uh, the RECs and the renewable um, energy, uh, uh, energy certificates. But the idea is that that will uh, diminish with time so that we actually have a net overall reduction in, in our, our overall emissions, um, hoping to get down to uh, uh, this level here, about 80,000 tonnes um, internationally. But the take home measures on that, or the take home messages on that are basically do your homework, liaise with organizations such as the science-based targets and there are other organizations out there that will help you identify those um, so that you can have a confidence in when you're making public statements that you you can actually achieve those and we did we did get to um, carbon zero by the end of last year this model is an important one for you to be aware of as well this is the basically called the donut economics model and the idea is basically that um, beyond the outside rings of the donut when we're where our footprint um, is 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 increasing you can see here this is basically if you like the the planetary boundaries of what the the uh, the planet can can tolerate and there's very many different aspects whether we're looking at um, food health education um, social equality housing etc and if you're overshooting we're heading into the realms of uh, beyond the capacity of of uh, what the, the planet can, um, can achieve. So look up, please, um, Kate Rawworth, who's basically the architect of this. And there's a, there's a link here to a very interesting video that I'll leave you uh, look at in, in your own time. But this overall donut economics concept is something that you should seriously consider embedding in the basis of your climate, uh, of your sustainability strategies going forward. What we've done in Jacobs, and we'd obviously be happy to talk to anybody that wants to find out more about this. Um, I'll just touch on this briefly. We have developed a software tool uh, within Jacobs, which is uh, for, for use both internally and externally, if anybody's interested, which basically maps various different activities um, to the 17 um, uh, sustainable development goals. So you, for each one of these, you set KPIs, you set targets, and then you run the model and it tells you how well you're doing. So for example, in this particular run, you can see that um, in the goal 11, in terms of uh, um, efficient buildings was, was doing well, whereas, uh, let's pick another one here, maybe gender equality or water and sanitation needs a lot more to be done in that sector. So it gives you a quick overview of where you need to, uh, to improve your, your performance. In terms of circular economy, this, we don't unfortunately have too much time to go into this, but um, it's a really important concept. So the, the bottom line is that the way that we've been living since uh, the, certainly since the industrial revolution is we, we make, or we take, we make, and we throw away. So it's very resource uh, heavy. There's everything basically goes to the bin and there's very little recycled. With the recycling economy, you get a couple of iterations out of the material, but effectively it, it ends up being disposed of. In a circular economy, the concept is that you continue using these materials as for as long as you possibly can. And yes, you will have some sort of level of waste, but it'll be massively reduced. And why is this important? Well, some of the facts are actually quite scary. So you know, 92.8 billion tons of minerals, fossil fuels, metals and biomass enter the global economy. And of that, only 9% is circular. So that's only 9% is re renewed annually. So 91% of all materials that are extracted from the planet are basically wasted um, on an annual basis. 
So that, that is quite shocking. And then when you consider global waste can increase by 70% 70, 70 by 2050, uh, that again needs serious consideration. And when we refer to waste, is that waste is only a material that hasn't uh, had a, an alternative source found for it yet. So we need to be a lot more creative about how we uh, manage our resources, how we uh, minimize the waste uh, byproducts, and those byproducts are actually used uh, efficiently going forwards. Um, but what's most important here in terms of economics is the fact that uh, converting to uh, a circular economy approach has the potential, uh, has massive potential payoffs of about $4.5 trillion for globally. And this is the value of uh, global economies that um, uh, can, can reap this benefit by uh, converting to a more circular economy basis. And one of the things that we've noticed over the course from an environmental perspective, um, it was interesting that, you know, for, for years before when the, uh, all the warning signs were coming out and budgets were being requested for, we'll say, ha half a billion dollars or a billion dollars for, for uh, mitigation measures for climate change. And there was never enough money spent on that. But suddenly with the pandemic, when the, the whole world was at a crisis, there was trillions and trillions of dollars available to be able to roll out the vaccine, quite rightly. So I'm not criticizing that by any means. But the point being that it, uh, it's interesting that when it's absolutely critical, funds can be made available. And what that basically says is internationally, people don't regard uh, the risks of climate impact and climate change as severely as they do the risks of the pandemic. And the fact of the matter is the pandemic can be dealt with, it will pass, we're on it, but we can contain it and control it to an extent. Climate change or the tra trajectory we're on at the moment, we cannot if we do not make that investment now. We cannot afford not to make the investment. Um, and from a Qatar perspective, there has been great work being done by Ashkal um, in, in the last several years, looking at how materials, especially aggregate and reclaimed asphalt pavement can be, uh, can be reused and on, it, on its projects. Um, and I think it's also an opportune time to mention the work that the QDB has done um, over, I think, 2017, 2018, there was a very key report called the Materials Recovery Report that came out, which basically documented all the, all the work that was being done in Qatar on the recycling of various different materials and, and the pathways to be able to do that. And it proved to be a very important reference document for environmental uh, management in the region. And also, uh, it would also be reticent of me not to mention the, wor the work that our incredible colleagues in the sustainability team of uh, the um, Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy have been working on, um, particularly uh, Ms. Badur Almir and her team there have done an amazing job in making sure that sustainability is at the core of the designs of uh, some of the most beautiful uh, World Cup stadiums I think the planet has ever seen. Um, uh, one, in, one in particular, <coughs> Ras Abu Abud Stadium, which is just across from where I'm speaking to you. I'm speaking to you from about here in West Bay, so we can actually see the stadium. Um, it's, uh, it's a marvel. It's the first time I think it's ever been attempted, but basically it is, uh, it's fully demountable. Um, it's being built just for the World Cup and it can be completely dismantled and shipped to another country thereafter. And the basis of it is a lattice framework using shipping containers uh, for, for seating and other facilities. So it is uh, taking innovation on, in stadium design and construction and operation to a whole new level. And it's something that everybody involved in that project should be very, very proud of. So if I may, in the final stage of, uh, of this presentation, just want to touch briefly on where and how and when you should start to think about sustainability and procurement strategies uh, or sustainable procurement strategies. Those of you that um, perhaps saw a presentation I delivered for SIPS a, a couple of years ago will have seen this, this model before, but it's as true today as it is as it was then. The bottom line is as procurement professionals, you end up um, basically driving contracting strategies, uh, letting tenders, managing subcontractors, and, and uh, ensuring that that work is done properly. However, if those tenders aren't scoped properly uh, based on a project strategy that might not necessarily be focused on sustainability because perhaps the, the corporate KPIs aren't yet in place that have a focus on the, the, the overall importance of sustainability. And when I mean sustainability, I'm not just talking about um, environmental mitigation, I'm talking about 
environmental, social, and economic um, sustainability for your organization. That, and that ultimately has to come from the very top, be uh, at the, the board of directors and ultimately the CEO. So when to consider sustainability? The simple answer is right at the very top of this pyramid. Um, and there is a mechanism to do that. There is the ISO 20400 uh, standard, which uh, you can use very successfully to be able to drive your um, sustainable procurement uh, strategies through your supply chains. Because the, the bottom line is, if it isn't in the contract, it's just not going to happen. Or if it is going to happen, your subcontractors or your suppliers are going to come back and they're going to ask you for additional fee, um, claim variations, uh, claim various different financial uh, aspects of it if you haven't made that clear in your tendering documentation. So why use it? Well, because it makes business sense, quite frankly. So United Utilities, this is uh, drawn from that report that I've um, featured just a, a slide ago. Um, United Utilities show that they managed to make financial savings of $6 million and improved procurement awareness or staff awareness in, in procurement by 100%. Um, so just by, by, following the, uh, by following the standard. There's four sections to the standard. Fundamentals, getting their fundamentals right, setting up your policy and strategy, getting a team in place to be able to enable that, and gen then implementing that procurement process. And obviously there's feedback loops for, for each one of these. So just touching on these briefly, the, the fundamentals means that you need to understand your business, obviously. You need to understand what your core subjects are, what your basic uh, business principles are, what your drivers are um, within your organization, um, to what, what you know, the, 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 the critical drivers to make your business a success and what the associated considerations are of those before you set your principles to be able to set up your core subjects. Similarly, feeding into the policy and strategy level then, once you've understood what those fundamentals are, then you're in a position where you can start aligning with your organizational goals. Understanding the supply chains, what are the constraints? Uh, it's all very well uh, procuring uh, a very nice suite of uh, low carbon um, uh, uh, materials, for example, a, a range of materials in bamboo from the other side of the planet, but what's the carbon footprint associated to transporting those? Or what are the chances, for example, of a factory that you're relying on a for, a pure, for, for an important component being in a floodplain in, in uh, one of the countries that are rather low-lying and uh, being hit more regularly by increased storminess? If that supply chain is interrupted uh, because of impacts of climate change, or storm events, where is that going to leave your, your overall strategy? And then how effectively can that be implemented? Where is the leadership and accountability in your organization? And how does that all fit together? So in terms of a top tip for this, this is the basic principle that it should not cost you more money to be sustainable. It will cost you more money to be less sustainable. And therefore, in terms of procurement, um, poor sustainable procurement or, or poorly thought out uh, procurement strategies will potentially cost you money, but effective, thoroughly thought out, sustainable um, uh, strategies implemented by procurement teams should generate savings by the uh, by the company, and indeed be directly contributable to your um, your strategy for climate action and reducing your your uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions and other footprints. And again, the, the importance here is understanding what the um, context is that you're, you're working within. So how is uh, the, the procurement process going to be governed? You know, who are the people that are, you, you need to be able to drive that? Um, can they engage with the stakeholders? What sort of feedback do you need to get from your stakeholders to, uh, to make that effective? Um, and what are the priorities? Again, about setting priorities, managing that improvement and feeding that back into the organization. And again, associated tips here are basically don't expect that all procurement uh, the professionals to be experts in sustainability. The bottom line is your procurement um, personnel may very well, especially I suppose graduates of more recent courses in, in procurement, they will be more focused on the, the, the uh, sustainability aspects of that and the importance of supply chain, because that is a very, um, it's a very detailed, very complex uh, area of expertise and should certainly be uh, brought into your teams, if not by new hires, by looking at training up your teams and, uh, and, and uh, getting um, external training or recognized international training on that. Okay, and in terms of 
online resources touching on that. Um, if you're not already aware, there's, a, there's an excellent uh, organization in the UK called Supply Chain um, Sustainability School, which is free to, to join. And there are a range of courses. Some I think you do have to pay for, but there's a, a, a significant range of courses that you can do in your own time um, by just simply registering with, with the website. As you can see, this is a screenshot just taken literally today from, from, their, um, from the courses that they've got. You can see here embedding sustainable procurement is one, circular economy indicators is another, and uh, the, supply, uh, the, the supply chain sustainability school works very closely with uh, other institutes such as the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment of which I've also got involvement. And, and no doubt they're working very closely with SIPs as well. In terms of circular economy, one of the name, the key names in the industry is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, um, based on the Isle of Wight, actually. And uh, Ellen MacArthur, or Dame Ellen MacArthur, to give her, her full title, was the first lady to sail solo around the, the world. And she discovered, basically, during that trip, that uh, being alone, uh, miles from everywhere, on, on a vessel, literally all the resources she had were all the resources on that boat and in her immediate surroundings. So she came, became um, intensely aware of the importance of managing those resources very effectively and not wasting anything. And when she got back to land, she basically understood the significance of this. And she's been one of the global key leaders in driving the, the case of uh, circular economy internationally. And again, in, uh, on, on that website, this course is available and a huge, num a huge amount of information comes from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is free for, for anybody and everybody to, to access. Other, other things here in terms of uh, the, the construction industry, um, touching on circular economy again, there are very many links that are available um, to, to be able to provide guidance on that. One of the um, books I think I mentioned in, the, in one of my earlier slides was the, the Handbook of Circular Economy by Accenture. Uh, I can personally recommend that. It is something I bought myself personally. And I can, uh, I can say that it's, it's an extremely well-written, easy to read, very informative book that provides a huge amount of uh, case examples and work examples of where uh, these strategies have been done in, uh, across various different sectors and it splits. The, the book is split down into various different technical sectors, be it oil and gas or, or minerals or um, manufacturing or whatever it may be. Uh, so it, it's, it's industry specific, which will be very useful for, for procurement teams if you want to see how you can embed circular economy principles into your strategy. Um, my own personal view is there is, it's impossible really to separate out um, a strategy that wants to look at minimizing your, your footprint in terms of water and carbon uh, and uh, on, on ecology without also integrating basis of circular economy. Uh, all of these things are very closely inter interlinked. And remember, there is no waste in nature, which is one of the key principles driving circular economy principles. Um, it's only humans that manage to waste things. Uh, any examples that you see in the, in the natural environment, um, there is no waste. Uh, any, any product or byproduct is used um, fully by uh, a myriad of other uh, creatures and, uh, and life forms. And on that note, um, I would like to draw this to a close, but I'm very interested to, to engage in, in conversation with the, the attendees and I would welcome any questions that you might, uh, you might wish to raise. Thank you very much indeed. Over to you, Sam. Thank you very much, Harry. Great presentation on the subject, an interesting subject, sustainability. Um, and I think you pulled out some very, very, very good points. If anyone has any more questions, please do put them in the Q&A button before, uh, below rather. Uh, I'll start off with some questions that we've had already. And the first one um, I think is the most poignant one. It says, so how can, can those in procurement contribute to their organization's sustainable goals? Do you have any practical um, lessons or advice uh, that procurement professionals can use to start implementing some of these uh, sustainable practices in-house? Yes, I mean, ultimately, it's the procurement teams that are writing the contracts and managing those contracts. Um, and if, if, you, if, we if we take an example from manufacturing, for example, and, uh, which is not my particular area of expertise, but I'll, I'll, I'll try anyway to just uh, be a bit diverse. But on construction contracts, for example, 
if, if you set out tender documents uh, for construction programs at the start, which become basically the default uh, tender documentation uh, or the, the d d default terms and conditions um, that, that organizations need going forward. Some of these construction programs um, are contracts that might run for four or five years. So if you get your procurement wrong at the start, you're stuck with that for four or five years. And it will cost your, your company uh, money at the end of the day, because as I mentioned in my presentation, contractors will come back and say, oh, well, you never asked us to measure our carbon footprint on this project. That's going to cost you, oh, that's going to cost you dearly now because uh, it's going to cost us this software and this amount of time. And, or you never told us that we had to have sustainably sourced uh, timber on our project. Um, we could have easily done that if you told us that at tender briefing stage or at, uh, at uh, when we were preparing our documentation. So this, this is why... I really do believe that your, uh, the procurement teams are, are, are crucially important. Um, and at the end of the day, we live in, in a consumer society, which is driven by you know, supply and demand, supply and demand. So the, the, key, the key there being that it is an opportunity for procurement teams to set what those demands are, to be able to drive, up, to drive the supply chain. And if there is um, universal agreement, for example, that, uh, you know, the, um, just to take a simple example, that wood needs to be from sustainable resources, um, or for example, that um, soya has to be sourced, if you're in the food industry, that soya can only be taken, or palm oil can only be taken from sustainably sourced plantations. Um, Imagine what savings that is going to be on rainforests in the in in, uh, in tropical areas, where they're being uh, you know slashed to be able to uh, grow these monocultures for palm oil because that's what the market is is demanding at the moment. And somewhere somewhere along the line, there's a procurement professional that is 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 making that uh, is signing on the bottom line of that contract for that palm oil. So I know that's a simple example, but it, it's just it's just to illustrate the fact that. If you want materials to be available on the market here in the Middle East, um, it's the procurement teams that need to set the requirements uh, for, for those when they go to contract. But to be fair to the procurement teams, and this is why it needs to come from the top, there is an inseparable relationship between corporate strategy, corporate sustainability strategy, and corporate sustainable procurement strategy. Those three are all the one, and they have to be aligned Otherwise, it doesn't work. That's a great answer, actually. And, and I think that's where the conundrum starts. That's where the problem happens, where those three are not aligned. But um, I, I think we can take the case around uh, procurement, taking the responsibility to ensure certain things are in contracts and recognizing, you know, the, the deforestation that's happening in, around the world. But, but how do you align the commercial aspects of it? How, how do procurement teams uh, articulate the commercial implications of uh, having a view on sustainability? Because the obviously the, the, the planet is being depleted. Um, that's one part of the bottom line, but to a certain extent, uh, their immediate stakeholders are looking at the commercial bottom line. Of course they are. Um, but also on, on, on that very, and, and quite rightly so, um, they have to look at the commercial bottom line. Um, but, you know, the, the, there is a sound business case there, for example, for looking closer at a circular economy model than our linear economy model at the moment. So why would you want to go and spend money on, on virgin materials that you have to spend money on importing from abroad, where maybe there's an organization, there's a company that is producing a byproduct that currently is going to landfill, and that could just as easily uh, be a, a key element of uh, your manufacturing process. So th this is where we need society as a whole to start talking to each other, uh, to start understanding that uh, what you regard as waste, another organization might regard as a raw material. And maybe they're only a few kilometers down the road. You don't know. So that's in terms of um, the commercial viability, uh, we need to stop, take a step back and see how we can do things better. Um, similarly, I think one of the things the pandemic taught us from a, a commercial perspective is the, uh, the vulnerability and the fragility of, uh, of supply chains. You know, there's, uh, there was an assumption that you know, you could always get a particular material from a particular part of the world. But when everybody went into lockdown, that, uh, that threw everything into, into chaos. Um, 
And that's just the, the pandemic's impact. As I mentioned in my presentation as well, if you're reliant on a particular factory to put, uh, in, in, uh, in Southeast Asia, for example, to, provi to provide uh, a particular component, um, and they happen to be in the flood zone or they happen to be close to the coast and they happen to get hammered by a hurricane that wipes out that uh, manufacturing for six months, eight months, whatever that period may be, that's going to have a direct commercial impact on you because not only can you not prepare or produce your, your, uh, your products, you're going to lose potentially that market with another client that is relying on you and they're just going to switch suppliers to a more resilient, uh, to, to a supplier with a more resilient supply chain. Excellent. Um, another question that's just come in is asking specifically about Jacobs. So uh, how did you, sustainability at Jacobs, you obviously take it quite seriously now. So um, what the person asking the question is trying to figure out is um, how did you manage to get the buy-in of all stakeholders within Jacobs? Um, I know this sounds maybe slightly cheesy, but um, we have a fantastic CEO who was personally committed to, to sustainability. Um, in fact, when he came to, to Doha about, uh, was it the, um, about September, 2019, um, he was actually in the, in the SC buildings at the time. And I asked him, you know, how serious is, is Jacobs looking to take sustainability and climate action going forwards? And he said, in the next six months, we were gonna have our climate action plan released. It's gonna be released on uh, Earth Day, April, 2020. And we're going to be shooting for you know carbon zero and the whole business is, is going to do this and we're going to achieve it and it came from the top he was personally involved in it we've got a fantastic sustainability team at, at corporate level it's cascaded down through the business and and everybody buys in um there's always work to do um there, there, there's always room for improvement i'm not saying that you know we've got rolls royce systems in place but we are quite proud of the fact that we do have a robust uh, climate action plan in place um, and has set us on, on a good course. But yeah, for sure, there's, there's always room for improvement, Sam. So it's easier when it comes from the top is, is, is what we're saying. And I mean, when, it, when it's cascaded down from the top, then it's easy to align all practices, uh, your sustainable strategy, your sustainable procurement strategy and everything that lies above it. But I guess the difficulty is when you're working upwards uh, and, right. uh, and uh, have you come across uh, you know, additional challenges of people trying to um, upsell the sustainability uh, message and any successes in, in that area? Um, I think it's getting easier. Um, there's certainly been a step change in awareness, I think, across all sectors internationally over the last two to three years. Um, the Paris Accord was came out with uh, with a bang then it was it dropped off for several years and you know I think there's general understanding that various different cops thereafter were more of a cop out than achieving anything um, then the pandemic hit and there was a real fear that people would go back in time and uh, retreat retract and you know there, there was uh, you know the other main players globally that uh, were not necessarily buying into the Paris Accord without mentioning any, I'm sure we all know what they, what I'm referring to. Um, those main players are now rejoining the Paris Accord, which makes, which makes a very big difference. Uh, without the political buy-in, it's, it's very difficult to make uh, any changes. So what, the point there is that from an international global perspective, there's been an increase in political drive um, and, and government drive to, to increase focus on these. And that does cascade down into, into businesses, government agencies, um, you know, across various different sectors. So if you've got that um, top down drive as part of the dynamics in the market, uh, you have something that is, is readily, you have a point of reference of when you're trying to make the case for why, for example, uh, an organization might want to, to consider co-locating or industrial symbiosis when they're looking at a master plan. Um, five or six years ago, that would have been a much tougher sell than it is today. It's, it's, it's still not a walk in the park. It still takes some doing to be able to get, uh, to get the buy-in, but certainly the dynamics internationally are changing. And I think generally speaking, uh, accountants and business managers um, are, are beginning to understand that there is, needs to be a different way of doing business. And is there, I mean, is there a regional outlier? Is there a, a, a part of the world that's doing this better? And how, how do you kind of 
benchmark or compare region to region or country to country? Are, are there centers of excellence when it comes to um, sustainable business practice? I think, well, let me caveat what I'm just about to say by saying that it's not always appropriate to cookie cutter an approach from one geography into another geography. Okay, that, that, that's uh, an important point to make. Um, but yes, I think it's fair to say that the UK and Europe um, are, are way ahead of the game and always have been. I mean, look, Scandinavia have been recycling since, what, 40 years, 40, 50 years probably. Um, UK managed to get on that particular train maybe about 15, 20 years ago, maybe a bit more. Um, and other countries, just, just on the basic simple point of, of recycling as, as an indicator. Um, so yes, to answer your question, uh, Sam, the, there are centers of excellence. Amsterdam, for example, the City Council of Amsterdam um, is the, the first such governing body, I think, in the world to put circular economy principles as the basis of its governance. So that, that is across the, across the board on, on everything the Amsterdam government do. Um, and then you've got the European Green Deal, which is coming through, which is setting targets, very clear targets for 2050. Um, some countries are catching up. My own country, Ireland, for example, has made huge strides in the last two years in particular to try and uh, catch up um, from, from where they were to, to, uh, to other countries, but now making massive strides in terms of um, offshore renewable energy. Um, floating offshore wind is, is going to be a mainstay of the Irish economy going forwards. Um, so, yes, there are. Uh, it is more challenging in some areas to, to achieve uh, sustainability, um, given, let's say, extreme climate conditions that we've got here in the Middle East. But that said, we've got almost unlimited solar power. Um, and that is something that is being taken forward by stakeholders in the region. But um, maybe that could be accelerated. Awesome. And uh, I think one thing that you mentioned and that's come out in the in the chat and in the questions as well is around what the pandemic has forced us to do. So uh, I think you mentioned business travel, for example, uh, being a huge contributor to your carbon footprint. And uh, whether or not you had a strategy around that or not, you, I'm sure you've managed to reduce that significantly. Um, so you've probably hit a number of uh, environmental or sustainable goals just by the pandemic coming along. How sustainable yeah are these uh, newly found uh, sustainable initiatives? How sustainable is keeping business travel to a minimum, uh, uh, maybe, maybe recycling or not printing as much, um, uh, some of the initiatives that have come in place as a result of the pandemic? Well, there's, well, there's, there's quite a variation there in the, in the, in the uh, examples you set out. Um, so some obviously are, are much more easily achievable. Um, Printing, for example, across multiple agencies, as I'm aware here in Qatar, excuse me, um, because there was literally there was the risk of passing COVID on uh, via printed matter, um, printing out a report and passing it from one person to another could potentially have been a carrier for, for the virus. So there was basically a clampdown across so many organizations that all publications or all deliverables had to be digital, which was fantastic because it's the way we need to go. Um, Unfortunately, it, it's also the case that uh, when, when the pandemic risk began to recede a little, and I don't mean to sound complacent because clearly there, it, it's, it's still very, very much present, although I think the, um, the uh, authorities in the region have done a fantastic job of controlling that. Um, but people are tending to slip back into their old ways. It, ah, well, we'd actually like to have that report printed now, you know, so... Um, I think on, on the printing side of things, I think there was, there was a massive and immediate change made. And the thing is, Sam, it demonstrates it can be made. If, if, if you can do this overnight and businesses don't fail, then it means you're doing something wrong beforehand, right? So if you're able to do something that's much more sustainable immediately and without business consequence, and in fact, to a business advantage, because suddenly, although it might be a small cost, suddenly you've got no more printing costs, no more toner, no more engineers coming out to fiddle with printing machines, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in terms of business travel, which is probably the other end of the spectrum, that is going to be more challenging. However, um, I think we're all relatively familiar with the names of Zoom and MS Teams now, much more so than we were 18 months ago. Um, I, I think ultimately the, the needles will swing back a little bit 
towards uh, the importance of having face-to-face -face meetings and face-to-face -face chats as the as the risk recedes or you know the populations are are um, a greater proportion of the population are, are vaccinated etc cetera, etc cetera, and the risks are, are manageable um, then i think we will obviously see a slight upturn in, in business travel again in, inevitably from from um, from where it was during the pandemic but also again it's a business expense if the business was able to function successfully without having to spend tens of thousands of dollars on uh, on airfares um, it's a win-win you reduce your carbon footprint by the associated uh, flights and also you have less less business business stress another one uh, to, to add to that obviously would be the the foot um, the the uh, the square meterage of office space there is some some organizations have basically said oh no everybody's going back to work in jacobs for example um, our offices are being refurbished we're going to a smaller um, square meterage of of, uh, of office space and uh, employees quite often have the opportunity to continue working from home should they so wish to do so so uh, that is also going to be probably a business savings in, in some ways uh, because the, the 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 cost of real estate is um, is going to be less interesting so we are moving into a new normal almost uh looking at the time we'll have to go to the, the the last question that we have and that's around how easy is it for small industries or, or small businesses or smes in effect uh to have and implement sustainable sustainability strategies so what do they do do they need to uh i mean it may be difficult to build expertise in-house um so uh do they go out and get a consultant what do they do I think you're, you're hitting the nail on the head in wider organizations can afford to have a much wider range of expertise that can help put these strategies together. If you're, if you're an organization of 40, 50 people, for example, then there's a lot of stress in the procurement team or on the CEO or on, on the team, generally speaking, that uh, uh, perhaps they have no need from one end of the year to the other to have environmental sustainability professionals on board. That said, there is a lot of, inf uh, a lot of training courses available online uh, which are highly regarded by you know, international institutes, such as your good selves. Um, the uh, Sustainability Institute in, in Cambridge University have uh, eight-week courses where people can get to the basis of circular economy, climate change strategies, carbon zero strategies. So there is training available. Um, and there's other institutes, obviously, such as the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment, which can provide that training uh, for staff. Um, it's a business decision, obviously, for an organization, whether they want to get a consultant on board to, to come in and assess what their, their business model is, um, understand what their, their, their drivers are, natures are, and put a strategy in place. That can be done as well. And obviously, that, that is something that uh, Jacobs, as, men, as, as well as other such consultancies, do uh, on, on a regular basis. So there's various different models available, depending on what the, the uh, target timeframes are. But the, the, the bottom line is, it has to be a dot on your radar and a very big dot at that. It has to be a priority for all businesses to make sure that they do have a sustainability strategy um, on, on the cards and for business resilience as well as reducing footprint. Harry, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for the information you've given. It's been enlightening. Uh, thank you for everyone who attended. If anyone is interested in attending a sustainability training course, uh, we do actually have a SIP sustainability training course running for two days from tomorrow, uh, I believe, uh, to, from or, or rather Wednesday and Thursday this week. Um, we've just put the link in the chat. So all you need to do is uh, click on the link in the chat if you want to attend that specific sustainability training course and we'll be happy to have you. Um, thanks once again to, to Harry from Jacobs. Thank you to QDB for uh, sponsoring the session um, and along with the rest of the, the series. It's been very, very informative. We've learned a lot about sustainability. We hope to see you again at the next webinar. Thank you all for attending. Take care. And thanks very much, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.